Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Welcome to another uh, database vac- or vac- vaccination database seminar talk. Uh, we're excited today to have Maltal Schwarzkopf. Uh, he is a uh, assistant professor of computer science at Brown University. Um, prior to that, he was a postdoc at MIT for several years with the PDOS group, and that's where he worked on uh, Nereo, which he's hoping to talk about today. And then uh, prior to that, he has a PhD from Cambridge University in computer science. Um, and then presumably you went to undergrad in, 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 so in, on, on, the, on the continent in Europe. But it doesn't matter. Once you have a PhD, it doesn't matter where you went. Okay. Awesome. So with that, uh, again, we thank Malta for being here. If you have any questions for Malta as he gives the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and uh, say where you're coming from and ask your question. We want this to be a conversation and not have Malta talk to himself for, for an hour. Okay? Malta, thank you so much for being here. Go for it. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, let's get going. So, um, you know, as Andy mentioned, I run a research group at Brown. We do systems, um, and my group is sort of broadly working on four different um, topics at the moment, two of which I will talk about today. Um, the first one is data flow systems, um, and Noria is the concrete system that I will talk about today, a database um, that enables fast websites via materialized views maintained through incremental streaming data flow. Um, and then a more recent um, direction is systems that enable privacy compliance by construction. So systems that allow us to comply with privacy legislation like the European Union's general data purpose regulation, the GDPR, by design out of the box. Um, We are also building Tuplex, um, a new Spark-like data analytics system that takes Python code and just in time compiles it to native code that has competitive performance with C++. And finally, we're interested in data center memory efficiency. So with all these in-memory systems, in-memory databases, in-memory analytics systems, et cetera, memory is often the most contended resource in the data center, and we're developing new abstractions for accessing remote memory efficiently. If you're curious about these projects, uh, check out our website. But um, in this talk today, I will primarily talk about Noria and then briefly talk about our next system in the privacy compliance by construction direction. So without further ado, let's get going. What happens when you access a website? So when I go to the CMU database group website, I get you know, a rather nice website showing up in my browser. But really what's going on behind the scenes, of course, is that my computer talks to a web server, which runs something like Apache or Nginx, and then some application code, probably some PHP or Python. And that application server talks to a database which actually stores the content, which actually stores the data that makes up the contents of the website. So this is a rather nice design and it's been very, very successful because it separates the concerns of computation and storage. Um, But one consequence of this separation into a stateless front-end web server and a stateful database is that writing an application that tolerates the increasing load that we get when many users are accessing the website is actually grimly difficult. And to understand that, let's look at how scaling a web app usually works today. So as the load increases, a single web server serving requests is likely soon going to be insufficient. So if, for example, the CMU database group website got really popular because you guys publish your latest paper, then the site might go down and Andy might deploy a couple of additional servers to to handle the higher load. And this is very easy because the front end servers are stateless. You can just spin up more virtual machines and everything will scale nicely. However, things get complicated when the database backend can no longer keep up. Um, And that point, probably what you would do if you you were faced with this problem in industry today is you would deploy a key value cache. So the sort of standard solution to this is to deploy something like memcached key or Redis to take some of the load off the database and serve some of the common query results directly from an in-memory cache in order to avoid having to go to the database. Now, these in-memory caches don't offer strong consistency, 
but they can take a lot of the read load that then the database doesn't have to serve. And that makes the whole system tolerate overall a higher load. But of course, soon enough, if there's even more traffic, a single key value cache is not going to be sufficient. And you're going to start sharding your key value cache and your database, in fact, replicating it, making multiple instances, and building a complicated uh, distributed storage backend. Now, this is a hugely complex software stack to solve a relatively straightforward and commonplace problem, namely serving web applications fast. So let's dig into the specifics of what engineers who deploy this kind of software stack actually have to deal with. And to do that, I wanna look at what Facebook does. Um, Facebook actually wrote a paper about their version of this backend stack in 2013 and published a lot of the details of what they're doing. So at the bottom of this slide in yellow is the application code. That's the stuff that actually displays the website. And then in gray are the various boxes that make up the distributed storage backend. So in particular, you will see that there's a lot of boxes here. And this is in fact, even a simplified view. I actually simplified this down so that it fits on a slide. Um, you have primary and backup databases, you have multiple different memcached pools, you have custom libraries like McRouter and McSqueal, and you have lots and lots of arrows going in between all these system components. In fact, Facebook had to build this complex interaction pattern in order to tolerate the high load that their service experiences, but also, and this is a little bit more hidden in the paper, but really crucially important, they had to do this in order to achieve even eventual consistency. Eventual consistency, of course, is the, the sort of lowest, even acceptable consistency level. It's often good enough for web applications, but without some of this complexity, Facebook systems would not even have a fit, achieved eventual consistency. They would have ended up with permanently stale information being served to clients. Now, you can imagine if you look at this picture and you see the many hours coming in and out of the application code, that this actually gets rather annoying for application developers who have to think about all these hours that interact with application code. And indeed, this huge complexity leads to bugs. Um, it leads to wasted cycles because there are lots of RPCs going back and forth. And it goes and it wastes a ton of programmer time because somebody has to implement all of this stuff. Moreover, if you're not Facebook and you don't have McSqueal and McRouter and libraries that can hide away some of this complexity, then you're really at a loss. If you're a small or medium-sized enterprise, not a tech company, but you have a website that needs to handle a lot of load, then you know, you're pretty much on your own. So what I'm gonna show to you in this talk is how we can take this complexity and use a new database, the system called Noria, based around the abstraction of data flow based, data flow uh, structured incrementally updated materialized views to take away the complexity from the application developer who simply uses SQL queries like they used to, but get the performance of a caching key value store backend and a database that can tolerate the load of a popular website. So the overall goal of the Noria system is to take complexity and reduce it, but also at the same time deliver equal or better performance to this complex forest of interacting boxes that people developed over time. And there are a couple of assumptions that Noria makes in achieving this. One is that Noria targets web application workloads. So this is a system that is really designed to serve the kind of database workloads that web applications generate. So um, workloads that are extremely read heavy, the queries are mostly point queries that are satisfied from indexes, uh, you know, no expensive OLAP, no big scans typically. Um, and importantly, eventual consistency is acceptable for these applications. Now it is gonna be acceptable because it, when they were using Memcached before, that's all they got. So, you know, it, it's clearly the case that web applications can work with eventual consistency. Um, higher levels of consistency, of course, would be desirable, but they always come with a trade-off in performance. And in Noria, we shot for maximum performance, but, you know, reduced developer complexity. To achieve this, Noria, unlike some other database systems, or I would argue most other database systems, 
is structured with materialized views as first class citizens. So in Noria, whenever we need to answer a query, we generate a materialized view. Um, and this design decision is motivated by the read heaviness and by the fact that Noria must scale. So the whole point of this is of course that we are trying to scale a web application. So Noria must be designed fundamentally in such a way that this application will scale out as the web application grows. And materialized views help with that for the read side. Data flow based updating of materialized views as we'll see helps with this on the write processing side. So um, let's dive in and start from first principles of how Noria works. And the first, print, the first starting point is that Noria to the application code, that's to the yellow box on the bottom of the screen, looks just like an ordinary SQL database um, in terms of the interface. Now I'm careful to say interface here because as we said before, it's eventually consistent. So even though the interface is SQL, for things like transactions that you would expect to see in something like MySQL or Oracle are not supported, but SQL queries that do uh, you know, typical joins and aggregations and selections and filters and all these things are supported. And the storage layer of the database follows a relational schema, just like in a normal SQL based uh, relational database. Now, in a classic database, when the database receives a query, like this query that in the example uh, joins stories with their vote count. So we have two tables here, a stories table. Think of this as an application similar to Hacker News where people can post stories and a votes table where um, people's upvotes get entered as they vote for popular stories. And the point of this example query on the slide is to count the votes for each story. So this is a group by count and then join it with the story. So, and then filter perhaps according to a block list that um, the user has specified. So in this example, for example, the outcome would be that the yellow query has two votes, the green query, uh, the green story has one vote and the blue story has two votes. Now, again, in a classic database, the way this executes is the application code dispatches a query and on query receipt, the database computes the query results over the contents of the database. Of course, this is terribly inefficient in a web application where you might get the same query over and over and over again, and just recomputing the vote counts for stories every time the application asks is clearly ridiculously inefficient and will be very slow. But um, we can observe that web application workloads as mentioned before, mostly reads. So a typical web application will have 90% reads and only 10% writes. So that suggests a way of making the system much more efficient by doing what we as computer scientists are very good at doing, which is to focus on the common case. So instead of doing slow reads and all this repeated work, why don't we flip this around and instead of computing on reads, compute on writes. That's the essential idea of a materialized view in the database. You compute the results of a query, you store them in a materialized view, and then when you want to read the results of this query, you can read them efficiently. When a write comes in that updates some data that affects the contents of the materialized view, like in this example where the application is inserting a vote for the blue story, of course, the materialized view needs to be updated. So the trade-off that we're making here is we're making reads fast, but the, uh, in exchange, we have to compute on writes rather than just inserting into a table. Now the materialized view has to be updated. So the count for the new blue vote has to consider this new vote, update some internal state to say that the blue story now has free votes and then compute the uh, join for that particular blue story, um, run through the filter and update the contents of the materialized view. This makes sense because writes are comparatively rare in these web applications. So putting a little bit more work on the right side in exchange for very fast reads is a good trade-off in terms of the overall load that our system can tolerate. And again, I will remind you that any read that the application code makes from this materialized view is going to be incredibly fast, right? If you think about it, if this materialized view is stored in memory in DRAM, 
And that's the fastest way you can possibly get your query result, right? There's no way a computer can supply an answer to a query faster than having it already stored in memory or in cache and sending it back to the, uh, the application that's asking. So this is the overall plan. We're going to compute on writes and make the reads fast. But there's still a problem with this, which you might have observed. And that problem is that materialized views can get rather large if they contain all the results for all possible queries that the application could send. Moreover, some of the internal states in this computation, namely the counts associated with the count operator in this materialized view uh, definition are not actually ever exposed to the application. And in particular, we're computing a vote count for the green story here that doesn't actually end up in the materialized view because the filter throws away this row. So this extra state, state for stories that the application has never asked about and counts that will not actually make it to the materialized view is actually using memory and is using um, space that is completely wasted. So this approach of building fully materialized views for everything that the application might ask for is not only wasting memory, it also would not scale because it would use an enormous amount of memory. So of course, also not how the caching solutions like Memcached or Redis work, right? These things will only keep a subset of the contents of um, the database in their cache. So well, it, it depends also to, if your filter is filtering based on the, the output of the materialized view, you don't know what is going to get filtered until you, you, filter, you, you know, materialize the view. That is correct. So, so okay. you're saying, Andy, that the green story, the count operator couldn't possibly know that it's going to get filtered away, right? Because that, in, some, in some cases, yes. If, it, if it's like a having several where. Yep, absolutely. Um, and we will actually solve that problem in, in Noria's design. Beautiful. Um, uh, so, so may I ask a question yeah. about the drawing? Uh -huh. So if you do the drawing, then, oh, okay, actually, if you do all, all kinds of these operators, where if you don't want to do them in parallel, then I, I think there'll be yeah, a lot of consistency issues, right? Yes, so, so our join, you know, we, we'll get into the weeds of this later, but our join is an incremental join. And to parallelize the join operator, we have to shard it by key. So that all the joins for the same keys are always processed by the same thread, but joins for other keys can be processed in parallel. Um, so, but so how, how, but, but how, how can we get, uh, guarantee the consistency uh, among different threads, right? So let's say even if you uh, even if you do the key partition, you will have the consistency issues among different threads, right? So I let, let, let me conv convince you later in the talk that we don't actually have consistency issues between di uh, different threads. We because the different threads in the incremental join execution here, and remember, it's all happening on write, right? This only happens when when the contents of the tables get updated. The uh, different threads will be processing entirely different keys on both sides of the join. So your keys A to L and, uh, and like M to Z will be processed by completely different threads. But you know, A would never join with Z, right? Um, A would only join with A. So we can make sure that the that updates for the same keys always get processed by the same thread and therefore always get processed sequentially. Okay. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so um, our plan is going to be to, instead of just willy-nilly building huge materialized views that contain way more data than the application actually needs, implement caching semantics where we compute only what is actually needed. And at any point in time, any materialized view or any internal state of our materialized view update system only refers to rows that the application is actually currently interested in which in this example would be the yellow story and its vote count. So the key abstraction that we introduce in order to achieve this is the idea of partial state. Um, and partial state you can think of as sort of the idea of a partially materialized view, which is a long well-known idea in database systems. But in the specific case of this data flow driven um, updating of materialized views, this incremental streaming data flow computation, that was actually a new idea. Prior to Noria, no, no, none of the existing data flow systems could handle 
partially materialized state. And therefore, these systems would all build huge materialized views and huge internal states. But Noria can have these absent, conceptually absent entries in its state, um, represented in my visualization by this bottom symbol, this inverted T, um, that are simply not present at the moment. If the application were to later need them, the system will compute them, but right now they are not being maintained and therefore the system is not using any space to uh, store them, reducing its memory usage, and is using no compute cycles to update these entries. Therefore, it becomes more compute efficient on write processing, which is really important because writes are the thing that Noria already makes somewhat more expensive than a normal database would. So this new abstraction of partial state is really at the core of the system design. And any state in Noria, with the exception of the tables, the actual on disk tables, any state in Noria with the exception of these tables can be partial. So any state apart from the on disk tables can have absent entries that are not currently maintained, but can be fetched lazily on request. Now you might wonder, you know, is this um, is this something that we could just use an existing system for? And there are plenty of streaming uh, data flow systems. There are plenty of materialized view maintenance systems, just to name a few. There's old Aurora and Borealis, sort of the early 2000s stream processing systems. There's Apache Flink and Spark Streaming, which are widely used in industry. Nyad, Millwheel, DB Toaster, you know, you name it. There exist plenty of systems that do some sort of incremental materialized view update. Um, but as I mentioned on the previous slide, these systems fundamentally don't support partial state. You cannot make a partially materialized view in any of these systems. In addition, many of them only support windowed joins and windowed aggregates and sort of uh, don't have exactly the same semantics as a relational database would, which is something that Noria also changes. But the key sort of fundamental limitation that they all have is that their processing models simply do not support partial state. A second, abstract, a second issue that these systems have is that when the queries change, so when you add a new query, which in Noria involves adding a new materialized view, these systems actually require restarting the system. So there's downtime involved in adding a new materialized view to the system to maintain. And that's a complete non-starter when you want to run a website that always needs to be on, right? You cannot shut down your system, add a new materialized view, and then bring it up again. So our goals in Noria are to um, avoid these fundamental limitations, and we achieve this with the abstraction of partially stateful data flow. The way we think about this partially stateful data flow is that it's a computation model that can reason about absent state. And it's supposed to be somewhat principal in, uh, in principled in the sense that we can define a variety of different queries and state representations. And yet, you know, all of them support this notion of partial materialization. And we hope to extend good ideas from existing data flow systems. Data flow systems have been tremendously successful in scalable big data processing. If you think about Spark or Dryad, uh, Nyad, um, these kind of MapReduce inspired data flow systems. Um, and of, of course, also the stream processing systems I mentioned on the previous slide. These have really great scalability and there's some great ideas there that we are trying to build upon, but adding caching semantics and adding the notion of partially stateful data flow that is required to make websites work efficiently. The outcome is the Noria system, which gives, a, gives you a high performance web application backend that you can use as a drop-in replacement for MySQL database with some asterisks that I will get to. And Noria computes only the necessary state to make your application run efficiently with the current load pattern that it generates right now, with the current queries that it issues right now. And the data flow adapts live without any restart as the application's queries or the keys that it, the, that it accesses, so the data um, that it accesses changes over time. So I will spend a little bit of time talking about four key design elements that make Noria work. First one is up queries, um, which are the way Noria recomputes and missing entries on request, um, a sort of lazy computation part of Noria. Then I'll talk about how Noria can change a live executing data flow, adding new materialized views with very low overhead and without any pause to system execution. 
And then I'll talk about correctness. I'll talk about how we design partial state in NORIA to achieve actual correct outcomes, um, in particular, how we achieve eventual consistency. We can guarantee that the system will be eventually consistent, which turns out, you know, as Facebook found in their work, not to be as trivial as you might think. And finally, we obviously had to uh, add some concurrency to get good performance and tolerate high loads. So let's start with up queries. So if you buy into the Noria model that I've described to you so far, then you will know that um, we have these absent entries in materialized views, and of course, also an in internal state of the data flow graph. But you might be wondering, what happens if the application actually requests this data? So in particular, in this example, what would happen if the application actually wants to read the details and the vote count of the blue story, but the blue story's entry in the materialized view is not currently maintained. In that case, Noria issues what we call an up query in order to fetch the missing entry and compute it on demand. In particular, clearly the Noria system needs to give some answer to the application. And the way to do that is to compute it lazily. So Noria defers computing the contents of the blue entry in this materialized view until an application actually asks for it, until it is actually needed. When that happens, Noria sends an up query through the data flow. It sends a message corresponding to this green, uh, excuse me, to this pink dotted arrow to the closest stateful operators, the closest materialized operators in its data flow graph. Now, in this example, the closest materialized operators are the ancestors of the join, which are the stories table on one side and the count operator over the votes table on the other side. In particular, filter being a stateless operator does not have a materialization. So the up query passes it by and goes to the closest um, materialized operators. Now, it turns out in our example here, the stories table and the count operator actually have the information required for the blue story. So these two materialized operators can uh, satisfy the up query and send a response back down the data flow in the forward direction to fill in the missing state in the materialized view. And you see this in the animation shortly. I wanna point out to you though, that this response is not a direct answer. It's not the actual entry that will go into the materialized view but rather the stories table and the count operator each send their current state for the blue stories key. And then the data flow actually computes the, the entry for the materialized view as it processes these entries in the forward direction, just like it would when it processes normal updates that flow through the data flow graph. Um, there are some differences in how up query responses are handled and we'll get into those when we talk about correctness, but in principle, this is the same sort of forward feed forward computation that you do with normal updates. Now, when the response arrives at the materialized view at the bottom of the data flow graph, it fills in the missing entry, that absent bottom symbol. And now Noria can respond to the application with a response that says the blue story has free votes. Now, before I talk about query change and adding new materialized views. Are there any questions about this sort of basic mechanism of up queries and lazy recomputation of missing entries? Yeah, I got a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. So, so the application actually does it, so when they perform an update or insert, do you do it on the underlying tables or it goes to the math views and propagate it down? Right, so it, the updates are, updates and inserts are always done to the, um, the underlying tables. So the ones that the tables that are at the top of my slide and then the materialized views get updated in response to the changes that um, happen to the tables. So the materialized views are auto, always automatically updated um, as derived computation from the contents of the underlying tables. It is not possible to update a materialized view directly and for good reason because the only way we can ensure correctness is if the materialized view at all points in time present, uh, represents a computation over the content of the um, 
of the base tables. Um, and again, because of eventual consistency, there can be some lag in what the what base table entries dematerialized view represents. But the uh, but but the data that is in the sort of more refined entries that sit in the materialized view has to be present in the base tables and the updates that are currently flowing through the graph. If you updated the materialized view directly, that would not be the case. And then we could get some really bizarre uh, correctness issues. So all updates always go to the underlying on disk tables and then propagate through the data flow towards the materialized views. So do you handle universal quantification like uh, not we exist don't. or left out a join or pull out a join? No, um, <laughs> if we did, well, we do left join, um, but we don't do exists. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to chat offline about the exact reasons why exist is challenging, but um, it turns out that supporting exist in, in an incremental data flow processing way is, is, is very, can be very difficult, particularly with the up query mechanism. Um, fortunately, in the web applications that we looked at, there were no queries that required an exist. Um, and we believe that even if such queries uh, did exist, um, you could rewrite them to be satisfiable from materialized views. Um, but we support, we do support left joins. So, but what, what if I do uh, update or, or delete on the base table? Um, how do you handle it? Yeah, well, so updates. Let, let's say we have the min and max. We have the min and max, and how do you, how do you handle this case? Okay, so there are two, two parts to your question. The first one is about deletes and updates. And um, okay. that is the, um, the updates that flow through the data flow graph, that like blue um, blue uh, you know, box that were flo was flowing through in the animations, these things are actually signed. They can be positive or negative, where a negative revokes prior positives. So you can model a delete as a negative update that flows through, through the data flow and, and removes any derived state related to a prior positive. So in the counter, for example, it would decrement the count in the materialized view, it will remove the entry, et cetera. Um, so that's how we handle deletes. Updates are simply a negative followed by a positive. So we revoke first and then we put the new data in. Um, you can optimize this into a replace if the view has a primary key. But for views that don't have primary keys, you do a uh, negative followed by a positive. Um, and then you asked about max and min. Um, so this is actually somewhat tricky to handle efficiently. Um, and we apply a heuristic solution, which is to say we keep for max and min, we don't just keep the max and min, but we actually keep the top K so that if the max or min gets revoked, Noria can substitute it with the next uh, the next best value, so to speak, so the, the you know max but one or the min but one, without having to recompute the entire computation over the base table contents. However, if you get extremely unlucky and all your k you know max values get revoked one after another, then Noria would have to go and execute the query over the uh, base tables again from scratch. Um, in practice, you can size k appropriately so that this isn't usually a problem. But it is, there are some situations where the up queries might have to do a lot of work if you got a very unfortunate sequence of revokes when you do max or min. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, and there was a question in chat, how would Noria handle the thundering herd problem, often cited problem in caching solution? Um, yeah, so this is an excellent question. And Noria, you know, part of the motivation for Noria is actually handling thundering herd because this is the one thing that the, Facebook folks had to put so much work into getting getting right in their system. So in Noria, if you, um, you note that if you get a query, a, you know, a request for some data that's not currently in the cache. So that was the example we saw in the here, right? In the previous slide. Um, we do not actually send multiple up queries. We send a single up query because the materialized view knows that it has already up queried this blue key. So that solves the thundering herd problem because we are not going to issue 10,000 queries to, to the database because the application suddenly gets very excited about reading the blue key, but rather we send a single up query to the database um, and then wait for the re response to come back, holding any requests for the blue key until the re response comes back, which is typically in a few milliseconds, then we respond to all of them. So no thundering herd builds up. I hope that answers the question. All right, so let's talk about adding new materialized views to the system. I said materialized views are you know, the sort of um, 
first class primitive of Noria. So when the application changes, for example, because developers are rolling out a new release that might add new queries, then Noria better find a way of adding materialized views that can satisfy these new queries. And in particular, the way we do this is we receive the new query and then Noria analyzes it to identify any overlap with the existing data flow graph that maintains existing materialized views. So in this example of a new query that computes the, uh, the comma score for users, which is the number of upvotes that their articles or their stories have received, um, there's actually a joint prefix with the existing query, which is the count operator that counts the number of votes by story and the join with the story details. So Noria can reuse two operators without having to install new operators in the data flow, including the stateful count operator. After identifying shared subgraphs, Noria then adds um, any missing operators and any new materialized views and operator state. But importantly, to make this fast, Noria starts with the operator state completely empty to begin with. So all entries conceptually in the operator state are bottom. All of them are absent. This means that Noria can deploy the infrastructure for a new materialized view within milliseconds because it only needs to modify its data flow graph. It does not need to actually process any data. That allows Noria to avoid downtime because it can do this in the blink of an eye. And then the application, as the application queries the materialized views, Noria then uses up queries to fill in the missing state lazily over time. Again, processing only the entries that are actually needed by the application, which might be a small fraction of the conceptual contents of these materialized views. So in this example, the application has read Alice's story count, but did not read the uh, uh, vote counts for other users who may not have been, may not have posted in many years or might not be popular at the moment. So this way Noria can support live query change. But one big challenge with all of this, and we've sort of touched on this in, uh, at various points in the talk already, is how do we ensure correctness with this partial state? You know, there are all these pieces of state that can have absent entries and there's all these updates flying around in the data flow graph. Of course, there's concurrency, there's multi-threading. How do we make sure we get this right? So to figure out how to do that, let's, let's first say what right means here, right? Um, if we think about the model that the system is based on, um, what we need to achieve to have correct state is that the state produced by an up query when one of these lazy up queries um, goes up upstream to fetch some state that previously was not processed where Noria deferred the processing, then the result of that up query better be the same as if Noria had continuously maintained an entry in each materialized view for this data. So in particular, in, in this example, if Noria up queries the blue story and finds that its current vote count is four, then that better be the exact same result that Noria would have got to if it had continuously maintained an entry in each materialized view for the blue story, incrementing the vote count every time a vote for that story came in. And we formulate a bunch of invariants, the details of which you can find in our OSDI paper, that ensure that this um, representation of state is always correct in Noria. Um, at an intuitive level, what these invariants refer to is that it cannot be the case that a materialized view that's further down in the data flow, so a piece of state that's closer to the materialized views that applications read from, contains a key that is missing from a materialization upstream of that um, state. Because if that materialization upstream was missing, then it turns out the not in, not in many cases, the updates would not reach the derived piece of state and therefore that state would not get updated and therefore it would not be correct. So the, uh, it, this is more formally stated in four different invariants that, that we have in our paper, but I wanna dive into two particular examples that illustrate the challenges and also how Noria resolves those and makes sure that the results are indeed um, eventually consistent. So the first one relates to concurrency. Um, if you have concurrent up queries and update processing in the system, which of, of course you will, because the 
um, up queries get triggered by application read requests and reach up the data flow graph, while the update processing, the processing of writes, um, you know, in the forward sort of downwards direction in my slide diagrams, um, gets triggered by application writes. And these things in a multi-threaded system can happen at the same time. So we must ensure that in this situation, we maintain correct state in our materialized views. And again, the goal is that the, an up query should restore state as if it had been present all along. But consider this situation where a count operator maintains state for the yellow story, saying it currently has two votes. Now, that means that at some point in the past, the count operator sent an update downstream that said the yellow story has one vote, and then sent an update downstream that said the yellow story has two votes. If now an up query arrives from downstream, um, asking for the vote count of the yellow story, the response is the yellow story has two votes, which matches the computed result that was sent downstream in a sequence of updates that occur prior to this up query. Now, if concurrently, however, a new vote for the yellow story arrives, we got to be careful to get this right, right? In particular, we need to make sure that we send downstream an up query response, that's the yellow box with the pink border, that says that the yellow story has two votes if we source the up query response from the state before processing the new third vote for the yellow story. Um, and then afterwards, we can send an update saying the yellow story now has three votes. But the up query response conceptually is a aggregation of the two shaded updates that are in the pink box on the slide the one that said the yellow story has one vote, and then the one that uh, said the yellow story now has two votes. That is what the up query response resp uh, includes and represents, but importantly, it does not include the third vote that just arrived. And if we were not careful about how we structure the processing at, at operators and in the data flow itself, this could easily get violated. Now, the solution on a conceptual level is that we must, when in a data flow when we have an up query response and an ordinary update that was processed at the source of the up query response after the up query response was generated, we must maintain the order between them in the data flow as we process going forward. In particular, we must maintain the order that the up query response um, in the pink box in this example always comes, pro gets processed before the update that says that the yellow story now has three votes. And Noria trying to be a scalable system has no global coordination. So it does not have locking. It does not, uh, not, no, it does not have global locking. It does not have timestamps. It does not have watermarks. It ensures this purely by its operators being written to maintain a set of invariants that result in a correct total order of processing. So in particular, this order is correct and produces a correct answer in the materialized view, but a reordering like this one, which could easily happen, for example, if you had a fork and then a join in the data flow, um, then you, you could end up with the up query response getting reordered after the update, saying that the yellow story now has three votes, which results in a state saying the yellow story has two votes, which is most definitely not correct because that third vote will never arrive because of the reordering. And that would not even be eventually consistent, right? Because even if you let the system run to an infinite time horizon, you would never get that missing update that got reordered. So what we need to ensure is that the up query responses always remain in the same total order with the surrounding data flow updates. And again, we use the invariance to, uh, the, the, uh, on, in our operator implementations to ensure that this is always the case. And this is easy for some operators that just straight line process updates one after another like filters, but it can get quite tricky for joins, for example, where you need to really make sure that when you receive an update on one side, you process that to completion, including any, any nested up queries triggered on the other side before you process the next update that the join receives. Um, there's also some merging of up query responses. There can be evictions um, because this is a caching system and there can be cascading evictions. Um, they lead to some more complexity that we discuss in the paper. 
Now, let me hone in on a second challenge, um, which is processing updates that touch absent state. This could happen in a situation where, for example, the count operator receives a vote for the green story, but the green story state is currently absent. Now, the count operator cannot emit a useful update for the downstream operators, right? Because it does not simply does not know what the vote count for the green story currently is. So we, when, we, when we designed the system, we spent a lot of time trying to wrap our head around what is the right thing to do in this situation. Eventually, what we found is that, of course, the right thing to do is to just throw away the green vote and ignore it completely, send no update downstream and do nothing for it. And rely on the lazy execution triggered by a future up query to actually recompute the vote count, including this vote that we just discarded in the future when it is actually needed by a downstream materialized view or by an application querying a downstream materialized view. All right, so that was the end of the correctness discussion. Um, any questions before we move on to the sort of execution model, the concurrent execution model for Noria? You're good, keep going. Uh, so I actually have a question. Um, um, maybe I, I missed this earlier, but um, how do you determine, um, so initially you said when you have a new materialized view, it's all absent. Um, mm -hmm. Is that Basically, is that al always how you start? So initially, if you start up a system, you have no state and only if it's ever queried, you will actually start doing that. That is correct. Okay, thanks. Um, now, you, you, you might be thinking about implications of this. This does have some implications, like you need to warm up the system, you need to, um, you know, you need to make sure that when, when you actually expose this to um, applications, they, got, you know, they can deal with the miss rate that they're experiencing. And you can use standard approaches like warming up uh, clusters. You can also, the system does, Noria does have support for fully initializing some materialized views, and that's a big batch computation in that case. Um, but that would be something that explicitly you explicitly specify on view creation that you actually want to now compute all the contents of the materialized view. All right, uh, let's talk. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, so to suppose snapshot isolation, where uh, let's say in your stories, oh, yeah, uh, let's say in your story you have the yellow and blue, um, where the where the user always see a consistent snapshot or. It just uh, can be, yeah. Uh, Noria does not guarantee a consistent snapshot. It, it, it guarantees eventual consistency, meaning that if, this, if you let the system TS and process all the updates that are in the data flow right now to completion and no new updates arrive, then you get a consistent answer. But there are no, there's no guarantee that you read a consistent snapshot. In practice, this is actually not as big a problem as you would think, because you can always um, define a um, materialized view for what you want to read and materialized views have de facto oftentimes give you give you consistent reads. Um, there are some uh, some exception cases when you have very complicated view definitions, but for most web applications that's actually sufficient. Um, I'll talk later at the end about a system that Facebook recently published called Flight Tracker, where they talk about um, how they achieve read your write consistency for their um, their pipelines. And that idea would actually apply to Noria. I'm kind of bummed that we didn't come up with this idea when we built the system. But right now, the system, as I describe it to you, is just eventually consistent, no snapshot isolation. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so concurrency execution model, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple um, story. We, um, we have multi-threaded processing at materialized views and at data flow operators. In particular, at materialized views, we use a lock-free data structure, a lock-free hash table that we heavily optimize towards reads. So it can support reads completely without any atomic instructions or taking any locks. But write processing is, a is slower, and write processing needs atomics and needs to do pointer swaps. And it's basically a double buffered hash table that gets swapped um, every time a write gets applied. Um, but this allows us to scale completely linearly for reads, which are the common case in our applications. Um, and when the writes happen, um, those are a little bit more expensive than they would be, but similar in cost to a, fine, a hash table with fine-grained locking. The other dimension of concurrency is concurrency in the data flow itself. And as mentioned before, we use sharding there. So we shard the data flow by key and we execute different shards of the data flow in different threads, but they touch disjoint data 
So therefore, there are no consistency uh, issues there when we multi-thread that uh, beyond the eventual consistency that the system already is, uh, is in for. So um, just to summarize the, the, the sort of uh, implementation detail part of the talk, um, Noria is uh, sort of uh, in, its, in its core based on this idea of up queries of this sort of lazy execution and partially stateful data flow. Um, they also enable live data flow change, which allows us to add new materialized views to the running system. Um, and all of this uh, is, is, you know, its correctness is formalized through the invariance of partially stateful data flow, and we support concurrent processing for high performance. So in terms of the actual implementation, um, it, we have a, a SQL MySQL com uh, compatible uh, interface. We in fact have a proxy, a MySQL proxy adapter that makes Noria appear towards legacy web application, just like a MySQL database. Um, and this MySQL adapter gives us queries, which Noria turns into view definitions that it then transforms into a data flow graph that we've seen already. This is sharded for parallel processing and the whole system is implemented in 60,000 lines of Rust. We rely on VoxDB for storing our persistent on disk tables and we use Zookeeper to elect a leader who monitors the distributed system for any failures. So in our evaluation, um, I'm going to talk about three questions today. Um, the first one is, can Noria actually improve the uh, performance of a real web application? Um, then we compare Noria to a bunch of uh, state-of-the-art setups that people use to run web applications. And finally, we check if Noria can indeed support query change with no perceptible downtime. In the paper, we also have a case study of how complex um, the uh, applications are that um, Noria developers write. The answer is not as complex as what you would have to write if you had it caching manually, somewhat unsurprisingly. Uh, we evaluate scalability across many machines and we compare with differential data flow. Another system that is similar to us but does not support partial materialization or any notion of partial state. Now, our experimental setup is that we have a single server with 16 virtual CPUs on an EC2 instance running Noria and many open loop clients that send requests to the server. We measure latency and throughput. And the application that we look into is an, is an applica a web application, a real web application called Lobsters. Um, it's sort of like Hacker News, a similar sort of forum type application. It's a Ruby on Rails application with a MySQL backend. Um, and the Lobsters developers actually hand optimized the uh, schema and the application queries in order to maintain cached upvote um, counts on stories and comments because they were too expensive to compute on the fly when the, uh, so when the application queries the database. So they had to do some significant manual work to actually get the performance that they wanted. Noria turns this application's queries into a data flow with 235 operators representing 35 SQL queries and requires none of this manual work that I just talked about. Our load generator emulates the Lobster's production load. So it emulates the, um, the distributions, the access distributions that you see in the real Lobster's application. So on this graph, on the x-axis, I'm showing you the offered load. So that's the number of page views per second that our load generator sends to the um, to uh, to uh, to the backend. Um, oh, sorry, that the, our load generator sends to the application front end, and each page view corresponds to in the median about ten SQL queries. It differs a little bit which endpoint. I think it's between eighteen and seven, um, the range, and then each. Um, you know, each SQL query gets handled by the baseline system or by Noria. And on the y-axis, we show the 95th percentile latency. So an ideal line here would be flat all the way across and very low, right? We were the, the further to the right you are on the x-axis, the higher the load the system can tolerate. And the lower you are on the y-axis, the lower the latency is. So bottom right is kind of the best place to be for a system. So here's what we found when we ran this with MySQL, which is the database that um, the real Lobster's production deployment uses. At about 1,000 page views per second, MySQL actually saturates the 16 CPUs on our um, machine um, because it simply is overwhelmed by the compute work required to satisfy all these queries. Now, on the exact same hardware, using Noria with its materialized views, 
we can support 5,000 page views per second, which is a 5x improvement over the load tolerated on the same, same hardware resources by the MySQL database. Now, this is not completely free because of course the materialized views require space, in particular, they require memory. Um, and the materialized views and the data flow state that Noria maintains in this experiment amounts to a free X space overhead over um, the size of the MySQL tables on disk. Now, we believe that's a reasonable trade-off. It's in the same ballpark that the space overhead of manual caching solutions is in. But of course, if you keep in memory caches, there is going to be a price. And in this case, the price is free X space overhead for a 5x improvement in uh, load tolerated. Now, in the so second experiment, oh yeah, go ahead. What, what happens at 5,000? Uh, so why is this skyrocketing? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So but the, uh, the reason that we are actually bottlenecked there is we're not using all the CPUs on, on, the, on the machine at that point. Um, we're bottlenecked because the thread processing a particular part of the data flow graph that's involved in processing updates for, for a particularly expensive materialized view definition, because that single thread that processes the keys for a particular slice of the keys in this materialized view definition, that single thread is fully loading a single CPU core at 100%. So we are bottlenecked there by the fact that we, uh, we cannot further, uh, further parallelize the processing within the single data flow operator because we are partitioning by key. Um, you could do more sophisticated partitioning than what we are doing. We're just doing equal range partitioning. If you shrunk the ranges and made sure that you know, there's more resources available for popular keys, you distribute the load a little bit better. I suspect we could move the, the green line further to the, to the right, but we are definitely not using the full CPU on, on the server at this, at, the, at this point, but we are bottlenecked by the data flow at 5,000. Uh, uh, so so uh, are you using a single thread to, to ingest the data? I mean, to, to handle the right transactions? No, no, no. Uh, well, so, so for, every, for every table, every, every uh, on-disk table is also sharded in the same way that the data flow is sharded, and there's a single thread for each shard. So in this, in this experiment, uh, there were four um, shards, and therefore there are four threads processing updates for each table. So basically no contention lines. Um, well, I mean, if you if all your updates are for the same key, then you would have contention, right? Because they would all be processed by a single thread. But in in, a pra in practice, there there's no there's no contention there. The bottleneck is actually further down in the data flow. Ah, uh, okay. So it's still the okay. So it's still the MySQL, right? Well, my, my, my SQL style transaction processing, right? Where it's not like well, the, let's say H store or or or, or carving, right? Uh, we are not innovating in the in the pro in the on disk table um, processing. Uh, okay. Processing. There's still it's a standard write ahead log with group commit yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the kind of stuff that you do in the database, but no different from MySQL in principle. Okay, but we will have dedicated threads for for processing a transaction process. Uh, no, for processing a data flow, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right, so in the next experiment, I picked, uh, we picked a single query from the, uh, from the Lobster's workload to sort of dig into a comparison with other systems. Um, and at the, the loads that are now shown on the x-axis are larger because we are only processing a single query while previously we were processing 35 queries at the same time in our data flow. And again, the y-axis is the 95th percentile latency. This is particular query gets executed in 80% of uh, Lobster's page views. So the first observation here is we, we tried a bunch of baseline systems. We tried the hand optimized MySQL deployment that the, uh, um, the Lobster's developers made. We tried system Z, a commercial database, and we tried a combination of MySQL and memcached. Um, and what you can see is that all of them sort of basically uh, drop out at about 100 to 200,000 um, requests per second because they cannot keep up um, with the load anymore. Noria, by contrast, for the single query scales up to 14 million requests per second, which is a 70x improvement over these other systems. Now, of course, this comes because Noria is super duper optimized for reads and this workload is 95% reads, um, but that represents the kind of read heaviness that real web applications um, see. So we believe that this is a, a good optimization. 
Um, we also compared to a baseline that is just memcached, meaning maintaining only counts, only vote counts for stories in memory, which is what this query reads. And this memcached only baseline, which is unrealistic because it, it really only maintains the vote count, um, achieves 8 million requests per second. And you might now be saying, hang on a second, Malte, you're saying you're outperforming a uh, unrealistic baseline, idealized baseline that, um, that does the same thing that you do, but stores less data. Um, yes, we do, but the reason is an implementation level choice, which is um, that we use log-free data structures and memcached uses per bucket locking and it's hash table. So we imagine that memcached could achieve the same throughput we achieve or higher throughput if they also embraced log-free data structures. So this is not a fundamental difference, but at least having competitive or better performance with memcached was our goal and we achieved that. So the bottom line here is that Noria provides a much simpler interface than the key value store because it's SQL based and it provides better performance um, in, this for, in, in this particular benchmark, um, you know, comparable performance being our goal. Now, my final experiment that I want to show you is an experiment where we actually add a materialized view live at runtime. So the materialized view that we're adding is we're adding a new view that introduces ratings for stories. Um, so instead of just having upvotes, now the, um, the users can leave star ratings. And on the x-axis in this graph, we now see a timeline. Time, time zero, where the vertical gray line is, is where the new materialized view gets added to Noria's data flow graph. And the y-axis shows right throughput. Um, so a ideal result here would be a flat line at the top of the graph with no interruption, right? Uh, remember our goal is that we should have no downtime. Now, what we actually see when we run this experiment is pretty close to that ideal. Um, in particular, observe that there is no gap in the blue line. The new view is live instantaneously. There's no downtime for write processing. This graph only shows write processing reads continue the whole time at a much higher rate than 300,000 per second. They're not shown on this graph, but they also see no interruption. So we see no interruption for read or write processing. And importantly, just one second after the new materialized view is added, 80% of reads for this new query actually proceed without triggering an up query because all the popular keys are already present in the materialized view and the queries for them are satisfied directly from the materialized view. The drop in throughput after the new view is added is simply owed to the fact that we use a fixed amount of hardware resources and now an additional materialized view must also be maintained by Noria. So the bottom line of this experiment is that Noria can change your set of materialized views without requiring restart and therefore is suitable for real web applications. And that brings me to the end of uh, the material on Noria. Um, we um, built the system, um, it's rather cool. It reduces complexity for, compared to the manual caching solutions that people implement today. Sufficient, up to 14 million requests per second on a single server. We find, think it's pretty easy to use because developers can continue to write their SQL queries. Um, and partial state was really the key idea to making this possible. Um, it allows us to make a very fast, albeit eventually consistent SQL database for serving web application workloads. Now, as Andy mentioned in the beginning, this is a project that I did about two years ago. So I figured I would include a little bit of retrospective material and saying, you know, what, what in retrospect did we do well and what could we have done better? So what we did well, I think, is that the use case is very real. We, uh, we certainly found that after we published this paper, we were inundated with people who wanted to use Noria, um, who really, you know, who had tried to deploy their own caching systems, who hand-rolled their own infrastructure. It was a giant pain. They really hated it. Um, and they wanted to use our stuff. Um, now, out of that was born a startup company, um, ReadySet.io, which I am not at all involved in for visa-related reasons, um, but they are commercializing Noria. Um, I know nothing deep about what, they, what they're doing, but you, know, you can check them out and contact them if you're curious. Um, we also found that the data flow paradigm at the heart of our system was really a good idea because it gave us great performance and it made parallelism easy because it provided a blueprint for how to make the system um, uh, process data in parallel. 
And the fact that we built a complete system rather than just a toy research prototype was a really good idea because it actually allowed us to test this with real loads, with real MySQL, with the real MySQL protocol and made it a lot easier to actually try it for, for people to try it out in the real world. Now, what could we have done better? Um, you know, I think we could have had a better consistency story. And as I mentioned in passing earlier, I'm kind of bummed that the flight tracker paper in OSDI sort of um, scooped us on this. Um, and, you know, of course, I did not have the ideas that, that these guys had, but um, the flight tracker paper is a really elegant way of getting video write consistency in data flow oriented systems, such as fa like Facebook's index update pipelines um, that has basically no, no, no overhead at runtime and propagates um, information with the data and gives um, the uh, client a, what, what they call a ticket abstraction that allows a client to check whether the read um, result it received is, is consistent or not with very low overhead. So it's really cool. Um, you know, I would love to combine that, those ideas with, with Noria. I think that would work really well. The, web. the other thing is more sort of an implementation thing. We used a lot of you know, Rust async libraries that we were very excited about. I think they were a mixed blessing because they actually made the system harder to debug um, and, you know, in the next system that I'm building now, I'm back to, you know, synchronous C++ and, you know, I find the debugging experience a lot nicer than dealing with this async Rust libraries. So um, just to finish, um, this, is, this is my final slide um, before the, uh, the, um, the slide I end on. Um, the next system, we're building a system called Pelton. That's a code name. Um, it's a, another data flow system, but this time in service of a different goal. Um, the goal is GDPR compliance by construction. So we're trying to solve privacy compliance through a paradigm where we break the database apart and we say each user gets their own database. Each user gets their own what we call micro database that contains only the data related to them. And then um, this makes it very easy to uh, be compliant with things like the right to access or right to be forgotten in the GDPR because you can simply send a copy of the database to the user when they invoke their right to access. You can simply delete the micro database if they invoke their right to be forgotten. But of course, the application still needs to consume, da consume data combined across users in order to dis display, display shared content. And for that, we use materialized views. And again, we use data flow for efficient maintenance of those materialized views. This system is written in C++ 17, um, and we're going for memory efficient design, trying to address some of the memory overheads that we saw in Noria. And our current single threaded prototype achieves between two to 14 million data flow updates per second, depending on the operator that we're processing. So that is something that I'm very excited about and that I look forward to hacking on this summer. But that's the end of my talk for today. Um, and you know, I'd be excited to take any more further questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay. So I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. We're a bit over time and I have a baby I, I gotta go deal with. Uh, so we have time for maybe one question from the audience. Right. Do you have a mechanism for evicting entries that are infrequently used in a partial state? Yeah, we do. Um, so we have a very simple mechanism, which is that when we get close to the memory ceiling that we configure for Noria, then Noria starts evicting random entries, but you could make something more sophisticated using LIU or your favorite cache replacement algorithm. And then when Noria evicts an entry, it, um, it, from the eviction point, it sends an, a negative update down the data flow, which evicts any derived entries as well. Okay, awesome. So, uh, Malta, thank you so much for being here. So, one quick comment. I, not because it's so similar to our database, former database name, Peloton, I think that you're going to have a, uh, uh, a searching issue because everyone's going, everyone knows the bike now, Peloton with an O after the L. I think if you call your system Peloton, unless you call it Peloton DB, don't, don't worry about it. This is this is not right, 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 right. I I, I don't think you. <laughs> this is yeah, the, I was surprised this, that you, you, you have an, a yeah name. database called a Peloton. It was a it was a, a turbine, you know, high high performance turbine that I learned about. That's not going to be the final system name, okay. so there won't be any confusion with Peloton. Okay, good. Again, we 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 ditched the name Peloton because of the the assholes of the bike. 
So it's not, I'm not saying, oh, it's too close to my neighbors. We don't call ourselves that anymore. So it's, I just yeah. know you have an issue. No, okay. we're, not, we're, we're not gonna get, we're, we're, we're not gonna try to get sued either. So yeah, it'll, it'll be that, they, Yeah, well, that's a lot of story. Anyway, um, Malta, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you spending time with us. Yeah.